understand how we can live our life with you more fully, more completely. We pray that you would be with us during this season of Easter as we walk through the writing of 1 Peter, helping us to hear its words, its consolation, its encouragement, helping us to hear its invitations and its challenges so that we may be a people who first and foremost belong to you and live as your people in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And again, I will be uh, preaching through 1 Peter over this season of Easter uh, from now until Pentecost. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, You love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it was testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in regard to the things that have now been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing and the meditation of God's word. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of your hearts, of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I grew up in Bryan College Station. As I was growing up, my my father had only one sibling, a brother that was two years younger. He and his family lived in northeast Texas uh, in the same community where my grandmother, their mother, lived. And so our family would go up there, I don't know, four or five times a year, spend time on the farm, the family farm in rural northeast Texas. And the six of us cousins had fun fishing in the pond, playing in the barn, running in the fields. One of us often scared the cows into the pond, which probably wasn't great for the cows or the pond, but it was fun to watch. As we would gather at dinner, the 11 of us, the two brothers, their spouses, the six grandkids, my grandmother, we would gather around a table that was probably barely big enough to hold all of us and a room barely large enough to hold us all. And we would get told who we were. My grandmother was very fond of giving identity to others, helping them know something good about themselves about their family, about their roots. 
identity that kids gave us at school could be distracting or even discouraging. But the identity our family gave us was always inspiring and hopeful. Well, the author of 1 Peter in this opening section gives his listeners their identity, his hearers their identity. He says in verse 2, you are chosen, destined, and sanctified to be obedient. Verse 3, you are given a new uh, birth into a living hope. Verse 4, new birth into an inheritance that's imperishable. Verse 5, you're being protected by the power of God. Verse 7, the genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold. Verse 8, although you have not seen him, you love him and you believe in him and you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Verse 9, you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, he talks about how the prophets spoke about the grace that was to be yours. Verse 12, that those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit were sent from heaven. So lots of really positive, encouraging, affirming things. This is who you are, chosen, destined, sanctified, being given a new birth into a living hope, into an inheritance that cannot be taken away or be lost. It's a great identity to have. A great identity to hold on to. And an easy identity to lose sight of. Because the world gives us other identities. It invites us to think of ourselves in other ways. And those other ways can, can make big claims on our lives. Those other ways can distract us. It can be hard to absorb and embrace this central identity of who we are in Christ when there are other voices clamoring for us to hold on to a different identity. So in my family and growing up in Bryan College Station, you may not know this, but the water that comes out of the faucets there is actually maroon Kool-Aid and we drink it every day. I jest, but it has at least as much maroon Kool-Aid as fluoride in it, I'm certain. You can't see it, but it's there. Growing up in that community, you are told over and over again, you are an Aggie. We are the Aggies. The Aggies are we. We're from Texas AM. You? Well, it used to be C. Um, we wear maroon often. Not many other people wear maroon very frequently. We, we do it a lot in Bryan College Station. And somehow, as a kid, I absorbed, we're the good guys, but there are bad guys out there. And as I've mentioned before, it wasn't the Russians, though it was the Cold War. The Russians never ruined a Thanksgiving dinner for me. That may give you a clue as to who I thought the enemy was. And again, that was driven deep into my psyche, deep into my soul. I know it's there. I'm aware of it now, and I'm aware of it in part because I've, I've moved around a lot over the years. So from college, I went to Mexico to the Yucatan Peninsula, and I discovered almost immediately that what we told as Aggie jokes, people in the state of Yucatan told against people from Campeche, the Campechanos. I was like, oh yeah, I, I know all these jokes, only we tell them about ourselves. They're like, you sound like Campechanos. But maybe, maybe we are. Uh, and, and then I moved to Atlanta, uh, and I learned about the rivalry between Georgia and Georgia Tech. And I married Nadia, who had gone to Auburn for a year and got drawn into the Auburn-Alabama rivalry, and then moved to Columbia, South Carolina, and got drawn into the, the rivalry, or at least introduced to it, not really drawn into it. I was an immigrant living in the Deep South. <laughs> in fact, when I had moved to Atlanta, one of my classmates on the first day asked me, what do you think about living in the South? He was from North Carolina. And I said, which direction did you drive to get here? 
And he said, well, southwest. And I said, yeah, you know, I had to drive north to get here. <laughs> Mostly east, but also north. He goes, oh, right, right, but Texas is a country all to itself. <laughs> and that's when we became friends. <laughs> uh, but getting introduced to the rivalries in Georgia between Georgia and Georgia Tech and Alabama between Alabama and Auburn and South Carolina between USC, which I found out was, in fact, not the University of Southern California. I, I didn't realize that it stood for South Carolina. Um, and, and Clemson. And then moving to Oklahoma and between OU and Oklahoma State. And I think it wasn't until I was in Oklahoma that at some point I looked around and thought, you know, every place I've ever lived has a silly rivalry between the two largest state schools. And they make a big deal about it, a big fuss about it, but it's just a silly little rivalry between people who are largely identical. They went to the same high schools, they grew up in the same town, they're from the same place, they more or less think the same, although they wouldn't admit that. It's only in Texas that the rivalry's different. We have a true fight between good and evil. It's not a, oh wait, maybe ours is a silly rivalry too, and I've been sucked into that my whole life long. But maybe the rivalry between A&M and Texas is very similar to all these other sibling rivalries within each state. And so I started trying to distance myself a bit from it. Maybe, maybe the trigger was going to the football game after the bonfire collapsed in 1999. Going to a game in which I saw burnt orange, which to this date causes a chill to go up and down my spine. It's socialized into me. I can't help it. But when I saw all those shirts that were burnt orange on that fall afternoon in 1999, every single one of them, every one of them, had a maroon and white ribbon on them. The Texas band did a classy job of showing honor to A&M and, and to the fallen students at the game that day. There was a card sent from the University of Texas that's, that was actually two or three sheets of eight by four foot plywood hinged together and set up in our Memorial Student Center. It's a reminder that the students at these schools went to high school together. Many of the kids that were at the University of Texas at that time had friends who died in the bonfire as well. And sometimes it's helpful to have these identities that we hold on to that come to be more central to our thinking than we realize hold into question. Kind of set to the side and said, maybe that's not as important as your shared humanity, as your life together. So by the time my three kids were getting ready to think about college, I began telling them, you know, you're going to have to apply to A&M, Texas, and the University of Tulsa. You can apply anywhere else you want to. You can go where you get the best package and where it's going to be the right place for you. But you're going to have to apply to the University of Texas. They did. Austin went to a dog and pony show there. Just about undid me. I didn't commit to wearing burnt orange his freshman year if he went. But if he finished a year there, then I'd start wearing burnt orange. Old loyalties die hard. I, I had someone ask me recently, but you know when A&M isn't playing Texas, you root for Texas, right? Well, actually, no. <laughs> actually, it's the opposite. And there's something perverse within me that gets really giddy when there's a humiliating loss over in Austin. 
deeply ingrained things die hard. At a logical level, I could tell my kids, you've got to apply there. It's a great school. It may be a better school for you than A&M would be. But when we get these things deeply ingrained in us, it's just about who wins and who loses, and we want our side to win and the other side to lose. And that's all that matters. It's great business for universities. They bring in scads of dollars, of millions of dollars, on the strength of people wanting their football team to be better than the other school's football team. It's big, big business for them. They also know that many students will want to go to their university, not because it's the better school for them, but because the loyalty's there. They couldn't go anywhere else. They'd have to go to that school. And so Peter, or the, the author of 1 Peter, in writing to this community, uh, tells them, in this you rejoice, or a little note that you'll see at the bottom of the Bible says, rejoice in this, maybe a command. Either in this you rejoice, or rejoice in this. And, and the most immediately, uh, immediate precursor to that is, is all of this about uh, you are chosen, destined, sanctified, you're given a new birth to an, uh, a living hope into an inheritance that it's imperishable, uh, yada, yada. Uh, but, but I think it's rejoicing in more than that. Rejoicing also in that you are exiles, which sounds counterintuitive. Why would anybody rejoice in being run out of their home country and not able to return? Uh, maybe there was a level at which these people actually were political exiles. That, that's a possibility. Maybe there's a level at which the, this author is trying to get into the same metaphor, the same way of thinking as Paul was in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul says, your citizenship is in heaven. You don't belong here. Your citizenship is in heaven. And, and that's really what Christians were saying every time they said Jesus is Lord, they were effectively saying Caesar is not Lord, which is what they were supposed to say in the Roman Empire. To say Jesus is Lord is a way of saying I belong to something different. My citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. My citizenship is not primarily, first and foremost, in being Roman. Even if I am, and as Paul would do, he banked on his Roman citizenship uh, to get him better treatment in the courts. It's not that that identity went away. It, it's that it became sidelined somewhat. So that the central identity would be, I belong to God. I don't belong to Rome. I belong to God. To be an immigrant or to be an exile is to be kind of like me living in Georgia, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Mexico, where you don't really have a dog in the fight of their local rivalries. So their rivalries can even look a little bit silly. But more importantly, if I lived in Georgia or in South Carolina or in Oklahoma and my kids were going to be going to one of the state schools, I could evaluate them based on their merits not based on some kind of loyalty that was shading my thinking, that was keeping me from being able to see what really was right in front of me. I think our present situation may somewhat be a match for what the churches were facing at the time that this author wrote his letter. The present U.S. Uh, church, the church in the United States at present, has, has lost cultural sway significantly, not completely, but significantly. We find ourselves more and more being ignored, marginalized, culturally considered irrelevant. Think about the number of Presbyterians that were in the Northeast at the time of the Revolutionary War. It was huge. The number of Presbyterians in San Antonio today pretty certain doesn't reach 5,000 out of a city of million, two million, where are we now? 
We're much larger than 5,000, I can tell you that. And so we're in a similar place, in a sense, feeling like exiles. People who look around us and the world doesn't look familiar to us in some ways. There are fights going on that we don't have a dog in. And then there are other ways where, like me and being an Aggie, we're very much caught up into the fights of the world around us. The author of 1 Peter writes, in this you rejoice, in this. I think not just the identity of you were called, you were, you were uh, destined, you were sanctified, you were given a new uh, birth into a living hope. Not only in that, but also in this rejoice, that you are something of an exile in the world that you're living in. For us, I think it's also an invitation to think of ourselves a little bit more as exiles. Many of us have been in a worship service where we've ended up thinking, this church is too political. May have been here. Uh, many of us have been in a worship service where we go, if there's a Democrat in the sanctuary, I can't understand why they'd finish the service here. Or if there was a Republican in the sanctuary, I can't imagine why they're still here where things tilt so heavily into an ideology or perspective, one direction or the other, that it's hard to imagine how this isn't a community that has been captivated by a particular political ideology. And I don't think there's anyone in the room who wants that. I don't think there's anyone online uh, that, that's part of our worshiping community that wants us to become captive to a political ideology. To think, for example, that we could only like A&M or Texas, to put it in those team terms. We also face a challenge. Politics impacts practically every aspect of human life and society. Meanwhile, faith lays a claim on every aspect of our life and our involvement in society. So the Venn diagram of politics and faith does something pretty close to a full overlap. Both areas look at all of human life. So how do we equip ourselves both to be citizens and to be a community of faith that's not captive by one ideology? It strikes me that trying to shift ourselves out of a particular team camp, at least to be able to do that logically, rationally. Because as I've mentioned, I'm having a hard time on the school team front doing that emotionally at a gut level. I've been in one camp so long, hard to look at things in a different way, emotionally. But rationally, just as I could tell my kids, you ought to apply to both schools. Can we learn to be enough of a, an exile, so to speak, from our own political process that, that our primary identity isn't in our political party affiliation, our primary identity is in being a child of God. Our primary locus of understanding is being a person loved, called, destined, sanctified, given new life, new birth, to represent something different in the world than the competing parties. Now, I mentioned in closing, I mentioned that between A&M and Texas, to get back to that rivalry, it's a moneymaker. Can I get an amen? I bet I can. <laughs> it's a moneymaker. And when A&M went to the SEC, I remember hearing some of the, the sports uh, talk folks that I listened to from time to time talking about how confusing it was for A&M. We didn't know who we were going to hate now. Was it going to be Alabama or LSU or Arkansas? This was before Bobby Petrino went on that fateful motorcycle ride and Arkansas seemed to be a threat up until that point. Who are we going to hate? 
That was the big question because we got to hate somebody, right? That's how we unite with others is in shared hatred of someone else. And so the schools make a lot of money by stoking a shared hatred. I wondered when we would rewrite our war hymn. A&M doesn't just have a fight song, folks. We have a war hymn. <laughs> Him? Again, once you step outside, you can look back and go, that's interesting. And when we were going to stop singing about the University of Texas, and thank goodness they're joining the SEC because now we never have to, right? Uh, anyway, life between Democratic and Republican parties in the U.S. is also a huge moneymaker. Media empires built on stoking hatred towards the others. Campaign coffers filled to overflowing by stoking hate towards the other. And at the end of the day, the people who have the money to do all that filling of campaign coffers are making an awful lot of decisions that you and I have very little to say about. So what might it look like to take on that role of being an exile, recognizing that our primary identity is something that unites us, that we are children of God, called, ordained, destined, sanctified, given new birth into a living hope. We are a people who are called together by God to bear a certain witness into the world, a witness that can critique anything and everything around it, that runs counter to the way of the kingdom of God. This morning, the Sunday school class was on the Theological Declaration of Barman, written in 1934 in Germany as Hitler had just risen to power. A fascinating, fascinating story about how that community came together to take a certain stand and how they would look back on that stand and say it wasn't enough. We weren't courageous enough. We didn't go far enough. We have challenging days ahead for us. But I invite you to think about that image of being an exile. A, an immigrant, a someone who doesn't really have a dog in the fight. Not the way I have a dog in the fight of the A&M Texas rivalry. Someone who can stand a little more at a distance. Able to see that there are Conflicts in every place, rivalries in every place, struggles for power in every place, and this is what ours looks like here and now. Here are the strengths of what we have before us. Here are the weaknesses. Here are the danger points. Thinking of ourselves, not based on which team we belong to, but as exiles who belong to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for writings from different places, different times, Christian communities trying to struggle their way through understanding what it means to belong to you, what it means to be representatives of yours in the world, what it means to bear witness to the living hope that we have received. And so we pray that like children gathered around the family dinner table where the parents and grandparents tell positive stories that help the kids claim an identity that's encouraging, an identity of hope, an identity rooted in love. May we be a people who find ourselves rooted and grounded in love, drawn together by an identity of belonging to you more than anything else, above everything else, even finding ourselves to be immigrants or, or exiles in a world where we have less of a dog in the fight because we have a different way of engaging the world. 
For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.